Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. This one is one of our short episodes. It's all about Iron Mike, NYC's Boozy Rasputin. And if I remember, uh, the premise behind this one is it's to do not with Rasputin being like a bit weird, even though he was totally weird. Uh, maybe he is also weird, this Iron Mike guy, but I think it's about him not being killable. And there's that famous story of like them, the, the guys trying to kill Rasputin and how he just wasn't reactive to the poison and then they shot him and he survived and all of that stuff. I've actually made a video all about Rasputin on my biographics channel if you'd like more on that, but only do it after watching this show or listening to this or however you get it. And uh, what happens here is Callum has written me a script. I'm going to read it. I've never read this before. And uh, let's just jump into it, shall we? The Great Depression was a tough time for New York, with a staggering half the country out of work. Many of those who had come stateside to chase the American dream found themselves jobless, homeless, and above all, hopeless. In the age of COVID-19, we've seen people turn to all kinds of money-making side gigs to make ends meet, delivering takeaways, investing in penny stocks, launching true crime podcasts. <laughs> uh, indeed, it's a real testament to human ingenuity, and the same was true back in the 1930s when bootleggers and odd jobbers hustled to fill the gaping budget gaps traditional employment left behind. Some routes to riches are more commendable than others, though, which brings us to today's case. Murder and fraud, for example, is not a recommended method for whipping up some rent money, and I'm about to tell you exactly why. I don't think we need to know exactly why, Callum, it's murder and fraud. <laughs> I'm pretty sure there are usually prison sentences attached to both of those crimes. This is the story of how one man repeatedly cheated death, stumbling his way through a nefarious plot against his life with nothing but dumb luck and several hundred gallons of whiskey to help him. Toughest of the tough, this is the story of Iron Mike, New York City's booze-soaked Rasputin. The story unfolded in 1933, right towards the end of both the Great Depression and America's Prohibition era. Alcohol was outlawed, but given the recent rising tide of human misery, it was in higher demand than ever before. To fill the demand, underground watering holes called speakeasies popped up around New York. These were unlicensed bars selling bootleg liquor to the down and outs of the town. One such place was the favorite establishment of Michael Malloy, a famous local booze hound who had fallen seriously on hard times. I learned something interesting about Prohibition the other day. I think it was in an, an, another video that I made. And like, rich people were largely fine during Prohibition because before Prohibition, they knew it was coming. And so they just absolutely stocked up with an insane amount of alcohol. Because like, I think while the selling of alcohol was illegal, they weren't coming to your houses and taking away the alcohol you'd already bought. So, you know, like Gatsby and whoever, you know, I know he's fictional, but like his real life equivalent, they just stocked up their wine cellars, something insane, and just rode it out, which I, I thought was uh, kind of cool. Despite his lack of funds, he would walk through the doors of the bar each and every day, greeted by bartender Joe Murphy and the owner, Anthony Marino. One day, while watching old Mike stumble out of the doors of their bar and off into the night, Murphy and Marino had an idea. There was a better way to make money off this particular customer than just charging him for drinks. With the help of two of their regulars, a greengrocer named Dan Kreisberg and an undertaker called Frank Pasqua, they hatched a plan to end Mike's life and turn a nice bit of profit while doing so. Note they didn't try and sell his organs, kidney transplants weren't possible for another five or six years. Wow, you could do a kidney transplant in the late 1930s? I had no idea, and that's wild. Instead, they, unless Callum's being sarcastic, but it seems too specific. I'm gonna look that up. <laughs> Yeah, 1954. That was a little way off. That was got, what, 20-something years later? No. 30, 40s. Uh, yeah, uh, over a decade later. Over a decade longer than five or six years, I mean. Instead, they decided to take out three separate insurance policies in a fake name before hastening the demise of their most persistent customer. This, again, this feels like a terrible crime. Not like a terrible, like, oh my god, crime, even though it is. It's murder and fraud. But, I mean, it sounds very unbelievable that the guy just happens to have three life insurance policies where he's basically like some washed up dude and then the guys who are going to cash in on it are just regulars at the bar I, if i was the insurance company i'd be like they killed him they uh, they 100 percent killed him police look into it the first attempt 
The next time Mike came to the bar, he was given far more of a warm reception than usual. Suddenly, Murphy didn't seem to care so much about his limited budget. In fact, he offered him unlimited credit for the evening. The owner, Marino, even came in to join the party and informed Mike of his plans to run for a spot in the local government. After drinking on the man's dollar for several straight hours, Mike was all too happy to sign a petition to support Marino's government, and the men toasted to a successful year ahead. Now, you've probably already worked out that there was no petition. Mike had just signed all three life insurance policies worth about $65,000 in today's money, with Pasqua as the beneficiary. And with that, they just put phase two into operation. Actually, it had technically already started because their murder plan was basically just to let Mike to drink himself to death for free. They even set him up somewhere to sleep in a back room so he could bash into the hooch 24-7. Every time he passed out, he woke up with a fresh glass waiting for him. Surely, no man could gulp down such a never-ending stream of free whiskey and live to tell the tale. There was one fatal flaw with this plan, though. Mike was Irish. <laughs> Biography Now, I don't usually go in for stereotypes, but the Irish tend to not shy away from this one. It's more like a badge of honor for some. Whether it was down to genetics, culture, or whatever, suffice to say, Michael Malloy could handle his drink. Born in County Donegal in 1873, Mike came to America in his youth and found work as a firefighter in New York. After being laid off during the Depression, he spent some time as a pro boxer before ending up on the streets of the Bronx. As the Daily Mail put it back then, he was among the flotsam and jetsam in the swift current of underworld speed easy life. Those no longer respectable derelicts who stumble through the last days of their lives in a continual haze of bowery smoke. He had no family. He made a meager living doing odd jobs like street sweeping in exchange for booze. Homelessness left him looking ten years older than his actual age, mid-fifties at the time, which was one of the reasons the conspirators chose him as their mark. They would soon discover, though, that Mike was far sturdier than he looked. Next Attempts When alcohol alone obviously failed to kill the Irishman, obviously, the bar staff started to supplement it with less savory additions. They started mixing his drinks with antifreeze, but to their dismay, Mike found this absolutely delicious and continued to guzzle down glass after glass. It speaks volumes about the kind of swill they must have been serving before. I, unless I'm mistaken, I believe that despite it being horribly poisonous and will make you blind and kill you, antifreeze actually tastes quite good. Or it tastes... Uh, I might be completely wrong on that. I've, and I've not tried it. Don't try it at home. I think I just heard this. Surely, though, if antifreeze wouldn't do it, turpentine would. No? Rat poison. No? Okay, how about some tainted food instead? Pasqua told his conspirators that he'd once seen a man die after eating raw oysters with alcohol, so they gave that a go. It was probably far from the worst meal Mike had eaten recently, so he kept it down without issue. Next, they served him up a sandwich of spoiled sardines, poison, and metal shavings. When he was done, he asked for another. Surprisingly, all of this fine drinking and dining actually had a net positive effect on Mike, who relished his new way of life and felt more upbeat than he had in years. Getting the man drunk was like giving spinach to Popeye. They definitely chose the wrong dude for this. Iron Mike is ironed. By this point, the cost of the free booze and insurance premiums was threatening to make the whole thing cost a lot more than it was worth. The gang had to up their game if the plan was going to make them any money at all. It was abundantly clear that Mike's stomach had some sort of inhuman fortitude, so the gang gave up on their attempts at poisoning. Mike could handle anything thrown down his gullet, but hypothermia was another thing altogether. So they decided to wait until Mike was blackout drunk, pour water all over him, open his shirt, and then dump him out into the icy streets of New York. It was just a waiting game. Now, surely one of the other patrons would walk through the door the next evening to tell them how Mike had been found frozen dead. When the bar door swung open that night, though, in walked the man himself, clad in a fresh new suit gifted to him by a passerby who took him out of the cold. At this point, the affair was starting to look like a Looney Tunes cartoon, so the gang prepared to end it once and for all. With the promise of a $150 payment, they enlisted the help of a taxi driver named Harry Green and took Mike out into the streets in the middle of the night. Two of them propped him up on their shoulders while the driver revved up his engine and careened towards them. Guys, you've got too many people involved in this crime. Isn't that like four, four, four of you or five of you now? There's ends an insurance policy, three insurance policies. It, you're going to get caught. You're definitely going to get caught. Even like police work back in the day, I know they didn't have all the like technology and stuff we have today. I, don't, I, I get the feeling they don't need a lot of technology to solve this one. 
The would-be killers leapt out of the way, expecting Mike to flop down helplessly, but somehow he managed to roll himself out of the way. It took another two attempts before a successful impact. Mike rolled over the bonnet of the cab and crashed down onto the road. To make sure he wouldn't be getting back up, the driver reversed over his body before a passerby caused the lot of them to panic and flee. The next day, they started calling around the morgues to confirm their plan had been a success, but they couldn't find any confirmed reports of a deadly hit and run. Five whole days passed like that, with the crooks impatiently waiting for confirmation so they could claim their cash. I think you know what's coming next. That evening, Mike limped through the door of the bar, a bit bruised, a few broken bones, but very much alive. I, I feel, Mike, at some point it's probably just worth going to a different bar. I know this is your favorite, but there's got to be a point where you're like, wow, a lot of bad stuff keeps happening to me. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't drink here. Death. Oh, so okay, so he does die. I mean, it's the 1930s, he definitely dies at some point, but I mean, I imagine it's soon. The murderous cabal at the speakeasy had really pushed the limits of their plan with no success, but they couldn't exactly just give up, if for nothing else than a kind of morbid curiosity. How exactly could Mike be killed? Had they found some sort of invincible superhuman like Bruce Willis in Unbreakable? By this point, stories had started floating around town to that effect, earning our hero the nickname Iron Mike and Durable Mike, among others. Frustrated by the apparent invincibility of their victim, Marino and his gang resorted to far more direct methods than they'd ever planned. Over the course of the night, they served Mike glass after glass of toxic wood alcohol until he passed out as usual. After that, they dragged him to a nearby apartment and pressed a hose into his mouth, pumped his lungs full of gas from a light fixture. And honestly, this just feels like bad sportsmanship at this point. The man had beaten them time and time again. Just let him live. I Yeah, that would have been nice. But uh, obviously, this is real life. So uh, that's not what happened. That wasn't to be the case, though. This time, Mike really was dead after seven long and costly months of attempts on his life. The gang elicited the help of Dr. Frank, another person. What are you doing? Stop bringing in new people into your crime. Dr. Frank Manzella to produce a false death, death certificate listing pneumonia as the cause. Pff, as if a petty human disease could have actually killed him. The fallout. It's going to be prison. They're all going to prison. So with Iron Mike definitively down for the count, the gang could go about collecting their money. They had little trouble collecting it from the first company, possibly because they had the help of a corrupt broker, but the other two policies proved more difficult to cash in on. The Prudential Life Insurance Company needed to see a body. On top of that, once the first lot of money was in hand, some infighting ensued. The gang couldn't agree on how exactly to divide the loot, and they ended up never paying the taxi driver his $150 cut. That's a mistake. <laughs> I've seen that movie War Dogs. They got caught because they didn't pay, like a company an insanely cheap amount of money for repackaging all the ammunition and they told on them i think and it all fell apart because they skimped out on some tiny fee meanwhile the police caught wind of the story of iron mike and were a little suspicious as to why a man should have to dodge death so many times in such a short space of time they spoke to the insurance companies, who delivered a shocking revelation. The same bar had been implicated in a similar death the year before. As it turned out, Marino had got a female patron blackout drunk before soaking her and laying her down under an open window. Dead Iron Mike's body exhumed and discovered the cause of death was in fact gas poisoning, leading to the questioning of the doctor and subsequent arrest of the entire gang. By this point, none of them were willing to go down to protect the others, so the whole story came to light through all their crisscrossing accusations. All four of them, plus Harry Green, the taxi driver, went on trial for the killing. In the end, Green would be the only one who survived the whole affair. He was only sentenced to prison, while Marino, Murphy, Pasqua, and Kreisberg were all sentenced to death by electric chair. No surprises. I mean, I thought they were going to prison, but I totally forgot there was the death penalty, so I'm not at all surprised they got the death penalty. That was the end of the story of Iron Mike, surely one of the world's most accomplished drinkers who could down a freshest week's worth of alcohol in just one sitting and top it all off with a hefty dose of poison and still survive a vehicular homicide attempt. Tell this story to your mate the next time he or she passes out after a can of cider. The moral of the story, aside from the well-worn wisdom that crime doesn't pay, is that if you're trying to kill Superman, you'd better damn well find some kryptonite. Or perhaps more aptly, if you're trying to kill an Irishman, be aware that whiskey and turpentine will only make him stronger. And this has been an episode of The Casual Criminalist, one of our shorter ones. If you enjoyed this and you're watching this, smash the like button, subscribe to this channel. If you're listening to its podcast version, a review would mean a lot. It would make a huge difference to me. It would get this show in front of more people, which is always nice. And thank you for watching.